All right. Thank you all for joining us today for the Ursula Franklin Forum. I, I want to start off first and foremost, of course, by the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It's been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still home to the many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work and gather on this land. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this. This is the eighth time we've gathered with this forum. Um, many of you and many people at Massey will forever remember Ursula in their hearts. But for those of you who didn't know her, I'm going to take a few minutes to do a somewhat longer introduction than we sometimes do because as the years have gone on, she passed away in 2016, the numbers of us who had the enormous privilege of, of having known her in person begins to dwindle. So I'm finding, I want to make sure that this uh, forum continues to not only uh, memorialize her name, but actually let people know something about her. Um, she was an extraordinary colleague when she passed away at 94. She had been at the University of Toronto for decades and decades. She was a professor in the Department of Metallurgy and Materials Sciences. She was the very first woman university professor, which is our Distinguished Professor series. And she was uh, not only a tremendous scholar in her own discipline, but also an extraordinary public intellectual in her writings and activist in her work for peace, for justice, for equity, and for um, um, uh, nuclear disarmament. She is amongst, uh, and, and she took it all seriously. Ursula was always about taking ideas fully to action in her own incredibly dignified, quiet, and titanium way. So for instance, when she decided to do something about gender equity for retired female librarians and university professors, she led a group of women of my mother's age who took the university to court to deal with longstanding gender salary discrepancies here at the university, and won. So an extraordinary person. Massey also lost another extraordinary individual this year, and that is our past principal. The, the current principal, um, the wonderful Natalie Desrosiers, will be with us later today at the reception. But her predecessor, Hugh Siegel, is another, when I think of all of the people that I've known in my life who were the most principled, the most dedicated, and the warmest, both Hugh and Ursula come immediately to mind. He was an extraordinary individual, and his loss is still felt deeply by Canada, by the world, and by Massey College in particular. So when I turned to find something to say about Ursula today, I realized I should go back and bring something that Hugh wrote when she died. So this is a little bit long, but again, um, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, roll with that today. So Hugh wrote actually a very long piece. If you want to look at the whole thing, it's got his usual characteristic incisive but humorous slant to it. But here's the parts I've pulled out of what he wanted to say because they serve as a beautiful introduction to Ursula, far better than anything I could have put together. So Hugh wrote, Ursula Franklin, an inspiration at Massey College. I only knew Ursula Franklin, physicist, philosopher, teacher, pacifist, author, and mentor for a few years. Upon her death last year, I was not only saddened, but desperately jealous of those who had known her and worked with her for so many years longer. As an experimental physicist who had been interned in her German homeland during the war as a young person because of her Jewish parent, she had been awarded both the Order of Canada at its highest rank and the Pearson Peace Medal for her remarkable research and advocacy. What truly set her apart from her colleagues, however, was her immense contribution to a nuclear test ban treaty through her seminal research with others on atmospheric testing and the impact of the migration of strontium-90 radiation through the food chain to children's teeth and her advocacy for fair treatment of female academics at the university. Ursula's pacifism was more than a political bias. It was a deeply felt, heavily researched, articulately promoted view of broad global interest. It was one she pursued with intellect, with deep conviction, 
and pervasive social responsibility. For Ursula, this was about the weight of history, the risks of misapplied technology, and our common duty to our fellow human beings. Before Ursula passed, the, the college had uh, put together a project to memorialize not just her and her principles, most importantly, it's not, not a personal tribute, she would say, it's a tribute to the principles of both her and Chancellor Rose Wolf, who was a huge part of Massey College at the same time. These are the windows that you'll see if you turn around and look to your right. These were done by Sarah Hall, an extraordinary artist. And since we're going to be talking about art today, I wanted to particularly draw your attention to them. And they're called the, the Wisdom Windows in memory of both Ursula and Rose. And Ursula has written some beautiful pieces about those windows as well, and about the role of light in knowledge and community and peace. And so in particular in the world today where we continue to struggle with these issues, I would encourage you to, to take a look at her writings, which were many, and her talks, which were huge, because of the tireless advocate that she was for peace in this world. And with that, we'll move on to our main program for the day, which is going to, I hope, touch on many of these issues that would have been very, very near and dear to Ursula as well. We're starting out first with a public lecture by a towering intellect who I've had the enormous pleasure to work with through a CIFAR research program, Dr. Nita Sahai. Nita is a professor in the Department of Polymer Science, but also intersecting with geoscience and biology at the University of Akron. And I think you'll be able to see why in her comments to follow, because her work focuses on the physical and chemical aspects of understanding how molecules, the biological and the non-biological world interact on the surfaces of minerals in the processes that brought us eventually to understand what we think we understand about the origin of life. With that, I'll pass it over to Nita. We'll have a 45-minute public lecture and then a half hour where we can all participate in question and answer and debate and discussions. And then please do stay on for the rest of the afternoon where we're going to have a panel um, looking at life from the other side I don't want to call it the other side, from an additional side, which is to bring the science and the idea of aesthetics and art together with our colleagues, Dr. Joel Orange from uh, York University and Dr. Charles Stankovich from here from the University of Toronto. Thank you. So thank you so much for that very generous introduction, Barbara. It's a real honor and pleasure to be in CIFAR Earth 40 uh, with uh, Barb as the leader there and to be here um, also with my co-panelists. What did I already drop? My analog pointer. OK. Um, I actually did not realize that Dr. Franklin had worked on strontium-19 children's teeth because as it turns out my research I actually have a connection with her, which tells you how, what an impact this lady must have made, and I didn't even know about it. Um, my postdoc, my first postdoc, was at Arizona State University working with a professor, Peggy O'Day, and she was looking at strontium-90 uptake in minerals because there's leakage of strontium-90 from radioactive waste under the Hanford Pacific Northwest, Pacific Northwest National Lab site. It's a DOE site in the US. And I had to wait for time to get on the synchrotron, X-ray synchrotron machine at Stanford. In the meantime, I started reading, why do I care about strontium-90 other than uh, radioactive effects? And that's where I found that it goes into teeth and bones, the mineral called hydroxyapatite. And the last 23 years of my research has been about how does hydroxyapatite bone and teeth grow in our body. So that's one side of my research. That's an in interaction of organic molecules and minerals. And here's another side of that same concept. Um, how did organic molecules get started on the Earth? Uh, that was a planet that was just atmosphere, gases, rocks, minerals, and uh, water, and whatever is dissolved inorganically in the water. How do you go from that to organic molecules? Um, and then from there, how do you put, make these molecules larger so that they start resembling something that life might have uh, eventually um, evolved into, like self-assembled into a cell-like entity called a protocell? Now, before we get started, it's always good to um, remember in this field, 
that there are seats up here as well. Yeah, that in this field, there's no actual record of how life went, how life actually first got started. So in this field of origins of life, we can only come up with hypotheses uh, for how to build the first organic molecules under some early Earth conditions that we can infer from looking at the chemical and isotopic signatures left in rocks from that very early period. Um, but even the earliest rocks on Earth have actually been wiped out effectively because of this phenomenon called plate tectonics, which recycles the crust of the Earth. And so uh, the earliest rocks are only about, only about, are, are four billion years old. And the Earth started four and a half billion years ago, and that's uh, with a B, billion. So in that first, um, and then the first isotopic evidence for life is around 3.8 billion years mm -hmm. ago. And so it's in that period around four and a half-ish, when the Earth started to around four to 3.8 billion years, where you go from this completely inorganic uh, planet shown over here on the left side. This is a, um, this is a, um, uh, artist rendition, Don Dixon, and I'm using it here with his permission. How do you go from a planet that's completely inorganic to something around three and a half billion years ago, which would have had these uh, biological, microbially built, what are called mats. These, these are called stromatolites. This is still going on today in Shark Bay in Australia. And when you look in, under the microscope on, let's say, a 10 to 1 micron scale, what you see is that these are being built by cyanobacteria, that modern ones look like this. Each one is an individual cell, and they're all hanging out in a chain. And um, uh, rocks dated to around 3.5 billion years ago from Western Australia uh, were discovered by Professor Bill Schaaf, um, I think in the late 90s, early 2000s. And he, when he put them under the microscope, he found these sorts of features in them and thought they really resembled these cyanobacteria. And, um, there was a lot of debate in the literature whether they are the first signs, fossil signs of life or not, microfossils. And eventually, I think with years and years of study, most people now, I think, have agreed upon these being first microbial signs of life. So uh, this is, say, four and a half, say, 4.2 billion years ago. This is around three and a half billion years ago. We're interested in what happened here. It's a black box. And we'll get to the philosophy of this field towards the end and in the discussion. This is something I'm also interested in. You know, if you don't, if you have no evidence for it in that period, then what exactly is it that we're doing here in this field? All right, let's see if I can actually make, oh, I have to point this up there. All right. So as I said, just to give you a quick, uh, this is a beautiful figure made by the wife of my former colleague. She, her name is Andre Valley. She's an artist. And um, uh, she's at the, her husband is at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where I was a professor 11 years before Akron. So we like to plot time backwards in the earth sciences. Giga annum, billion years. Zero means the present. And this is where humans are. Four and a half-ish billion years ago, the origin of the solar system and the Earth. Many important early geological events happened. The core and the mantle differentiated. The moon forming impact for had happened. Um, and in um, around uh, 4.2, uh, 4 4.3 billion years ago, um, uh, liquid water had stabilized to about 70 degrees Celsius. We know this by the discovery of a tiny microscopic zircon crystal discovered under the microscope, some microscope image. Um, that's dated to this age. And the oxygen isotopes in this crystal tell us that it formed at about 70 degrees Celsius. This was a huge revelation in the field, also published around 2000 because it was uh, the earliest that any liquid water, less than 100 degrees Celsius, had been known to exist on Earth. Before that, people used to think that uh, the Earth had been really hot and volcanic and just a magma ocean, hence Haiti and Pro Hades, up to around three and a half-ish, four billion years ago. Then we found that, oh, actually liquid water was around even as early as 4.2 billion years ago, which is great because it gives extra time for this prebiotic chemistry to have occurred. Liquid water can survive, organic molecules can survive. Um, then the oldest rock that is actually known is at about four billion years old. It's called the Acasta. Nice, is that in Canada? Yeah, I believe it is. And then the isotopic evidence that I told you about is from the issue of sediment in um, Greenland at about 3.8 billion years. Here are Bill Shop's fossils from Australia, 3.5 billion-ish. 
Um, and at around this period, we transition from the Hadean to what we call the Archean. There's a reduction in the amount of meteor meteorite bombardment around here, um, tapering off. And then um, we think that the bacteria that had evolved around here, which are cyanobacteria, have been adding. They were able to photosynthesize and add oxygen into the atmosphere. And over a period of about a billion and a half-ish years, oxygen kept accumulating, accumulating, and finally you got uh, some oxygen in the oceans and in the atmosphere to precipitate out um, the iron which was in the oceans in the dissolved form. Back in, the, back in this period, there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. It had to be built up. Uh, there was only nitrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, um, water, vapor. Uh, so the oxygen was built up by these bacteria over a period of about a billion years, billion and a half-ish years. And once there was enough oxygen in the atmosphere, um, life could evolve where you could have uh, what are called eukaryotic cells. Those are cells that have a nucleus and a much more complex machinery inside them than do the bacteria and another kind of simpler organism called uh, archaea, which would have been around in this period. So cells with nuclei evolved. These are the eukaryotes. And uh, these are still those single cell eukaryotes. And around this period, somewhere here in the 700, 800 million years ago, depending on, and you know, the new fossils are being discovered every day in, in China. They have amazing preservation of fossils. Um, so now around, I think, seven, 800 million years ago-ish is when they find signs of multicellular um, eukaryotes. And then it was only about 600-ish million years ago that organisms that you can see um, macroscopically, without putting under the, under the microscope, evolved. Uh, and so here's the trilobites that we all know and love uh, at the, what's called the Cambrian explosion, right? So before all this was known, imagine if you're a, a geologist or a paleontologist, Darwin, anyone, you know, the first thing you see macroscopically are these fully formed huge organisms, right? They called it the Cambrian explosion because they didn't know all about life that existed for like another two, three billion years before that, right? Three billion years ago. Yep. And then all the other stuff is just the wink of an eye. All right, so this is where the origins of life occurred, uh, where we have liquid water being stabilized to the first isotopic evidence for life at around 3.8 3 billion years ago. So that's the period I'm interested in. And I always make this joke in all my talks, I'll repeat it, and the rest of it is just details, <laughs> right? <laughs> Actually, what most people think now is getting life started may not be as hard as going from unicellular bacteria and archaea to the more complex eukaryotes. And by the way, this should be a discussion back and forth. So feel free to stop me and ask me if I'm using terminology you're not familiar with and I haven't defined something. I can quickly define in a couple of words. Yeah. Can you define isotopic? Isotopic? Okay. Isotropic, isotropic I haven't said. Oh, okay. I, I meant isotopic. So, okay, so the way that you can understand something about the age of a, of a, um, a rock or a mineral or something about the con uh, environmental conditions under which it formed, you can do the chemical analysis, say you can look at the carbon or oxygen or sulfur or whatever is in the chemistry of it, but you can also look at how in each element there are different um, masses of these different elements. So, for example, you can have um, carbon-13, carbon-14, carbon-12. These are different isotopes of carbon, and they're defined by the fact they have, they have a different weight in the nucleus, different number of neutrons uh, in the nucleus. So the life fractionates, or when, they, when life uses anything from the environment, it generally prefers to use the lighter isotope because it's less energy to metabolize. And so you end up getting what's called fractionation, differentiation between what's then left in that organic matter when it dies and you analyze it in terms of the, say, carbon-13 to carbon-12 um, versus what's um, in the non-life part of the surrounding rock. So that's how you know it's life or not life organic mo molecule. All right, so early Earth was very, very different, all right? Um, the sun was very faint. It had not yet reached its maximum luminosity to like it is today, so there was less, um, there was less intensity of light reaching the Earth. And therefore, the Earth may have been, there are different estimates we don't know. It may have been a snowball Earth. The whole Earth may have been covered with glaciers frozen like a ball. Might have been local areas like hot springs, geysers like this, 
which were um, liquid water, because we know that there was that zircon that was formed in equilibrium with water at 70 degrees Celsius. Um, or maybe the whole planet was 70 degrees Celsius. We don't know exactly. Uh, but it was somewhere between either being a snowball earth or being 70. <laughs> right? <laughs> Oh, what's a 10 degree, well, one, one order of magnitude difference. <laughs> All right, the moon, the moon was formed by a big another planetesimal smashing into the Earth early into Earth, in Earth history, and the two parts then mixed and matched and separated out. So the moon had just formed, and, therefore, and it was much closer. And um, therefore, you can imagine that the tidal ranges were really high. Okay, so you'd have a really high tide and a really low tide. The implication of that for prebiotic chemistry is you have large areas being submerged and dried out, submerged and dried out, and each time you submerge, you might bring organic molecules from the ocean up to the land, gets to maybe react with the minerals, you dry it out, then you have the possibility to, for two of these organic molecules, let's say simple starting organic molecules to combine. Many of these com combination molecules called uh, reactions called polymerization involve a water molecule being eliminated in the process. And when you dry the land out, that removes that water molecule that's being formed, and so it helps push the reaction even more favorably. Okay, normally, if you're sitting in bulk water, and you want to take two molecules, combine them, and in the, in the process of making that covalent bond, you want to get rid of the water. Okay? This is your biological process, or pre-biological process. But you're sitting in an ocean of water. That's, that's not going to be very favorable. So that's why the drying part removes the water, and so that, that helps for um, our, our reactions. Um, as I said before, no oxygen in the atmosphere, and so we have to try and use these sorts of conditions for um, mimicking what's going on in the lab. Okay, so very crudely, what does modern biology do today? We reproduce, we eat, we grow, we divide, right, our cells. Um, so the replication part depends on the genetic code, DNA and RNA. DNA is a double-stranded molecule. I've shown here RNA. Because people in this field think that DNA being double-stranded was harder to make prebiotically, and therefore RNA may have come before DNA. Um, so you need DNA and RNA to make, then, what are called proteins. And proteins can be structural proteins like our collagen, or they can be proteins that catalyze reactions, make reactions more favorable, faster. And in that case, they're called enzymes. And um, also ATP and NADH, these are sort of um, important molecules that are involved in metabolism. So uh, in order to make enzymes, you need DNA and RNA, or let's say R just RNA for origins of life. But there's a problem here, because in order to make RNA, you need enzymes. So RNA polymerase, for example. There's a whole slew of enzymes you need, but let's say RNA polymerase is one of them. So which one is first? A lot of ink has been spilt in this literature. And my personal take is you had all these starting organic molecules, starting small molecules in this soup. Uh, most likely they co-evolved. And I think the field also is sort of moving, is evolving in that direction where you don't have one thing coming first or the other, but molecules helping each other. Another part of metabolism, by the way, is for these, the protein enzymes then help to build other molecules. like the sugars, like the RNA and DNA, like the uh, membrane-forming molecules that are called phospholipids. Okay, so the three kind of things that you think about when you think about a cell is its boundary, in order for it to define itself from its surrounding. The fact that it needs to eat and grow and divide, metabolism, which is enabled by enzymes ATP and NADH. It doesn't matter what these molecules mean, just there's some important molecules. And self-replication, which depends on an information-carrying genetic molecule. So how do you make any one of these without the other is the problem. And so, of course, I'm a geochemist deep at heart. I pretend to be a bio something or the other. <laughs> <laughs> so it had to be minerals, of course, because that's what there was. Um, and this is not my idea. This is proposed you know, more than almost a decade ago now, yikes. I mean, a century ago. All right, so uh, J.D. Bernal and B.M. Goldschmidt had suggested this a long time ago. And I've just put pretty minerals on here just to catch your attention because this is art and science thing. These actual minerals, what they are, are not really super catalytic in any sense, OK? <laughs> 
All right, so just to give a little, this is very ge sort of general. Let's dig in a little bit more. Um, how do you make up the large biomolecules like RNA proteins, phospholipids? You have to build them up from smaller building blocks. So the large molecules are called polymers. They're repeating units of the small building blocks. It's like beads on a chain. And they're chemically bonded to each other to make them stick. Uh, the building blocks are called monomers. So we were talking about RNA. Here's a, um, a chain of, a short chain of four, one, two, three, four monomers that are covalently bonded through carbon, oxygen, phosphate bonds. And the monomers are made up of this structure. Details don't matter here, just that this is the monomer. You need to combine two of these through this um, OH of this particular monomer and the phosphate of the next monomer uh, happening over here in order to get the first dimer. Dimer means two of them, trimer, tetramer, octamer, pentamer, whatever, oligomer. And then very long chains make you the functional molecule because then they can fold and have functions. So the longer is usually considered to be better. All right, then we had the enzymes which are polymers made up of amino acids which are the building blocks or monomers. I haven't given you the chemical structure here because I'm not gonna talk too much about this part of the, uh, in, this, in this lecture. The short protein is called a peptide. In polymer language, that's an oligomer. Oligo meaning a few in the Greek. Oh. Ah. And they have the cell membrane. This is now not chemical covalent bonding of monomers, but self-assembly. So this is a process where physical and electrostatic non-covalent bonding forces control the self-assembly of an individual molecule, which is this whole thing here, into these sort of uh, two layers, so hence called a bilayer, and this is what the structure of a membrane looks like. So what's specific about these kind of molecules, you need these to make a membrane, is that they have one part of the molecule which has charged entities on it, like this phosphate, um, that like water, and they like to interact with water, whereas they have this part of the molecule which is made up of um, CH2, CH2, each of these squiggles is a CH2, okay? And that's a hydrophobic or water disliking part of the molecule. So when you get up to a certain concentration of these molecules, the tails, as they are called, the hydrophobic tails, prefer to interact with each other rather than with water. And the heads, or the charged parts, prefer to interact with water, which is a polar solvent. And so you end up getting in these bilayer sheets. And then just by random thermal fluctuations, these sheets can form a cup-like shape and eventually come together occasionally. And they make a total membrane or a vesicle or a cell-like, protocell-like entity. So we also need to make these molecules. But just as we said, DNA is too complicated to make prebiotically. RNA must have been a precursor. Similarly, this kind of molecule to, to synthesize it abiotically is extremely difficult. So people think that something simpler came before this, and we have to figure out what that something simpler was. All right, so in each case, what I'm gonna show you now is, I'm not gonna show you this process. What I'm rather gonna show you is how minerals catalyzed RNA monomer to RNA oligomer. Uh, I'm gonna show you here. I'm gonna show you how to make a simpler version of this and make a cell membrane in each case catalyzed by different minerals. And at the end, if you have time, because this I can talk forever, right? So if you have time, I'll come in to show you how combining this with minerals and a few other things, um, I can show you how to make NADH. I, I have not yet figured out how to make ATP. I'll get a Nobel Prize if I do that, <laughs> I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's the relevance of the organic material that comes in on meteorites? And you would have got a lot of it during the meteorites. Indeed. Walmart. Yep. You, your question has anticipated my next slide, so thank you. Yes. So these building blocks, could, not this one, they've never found them in meteorites, but the, the simpler analog of it, this sort of, not quite the whole thing here, but this bit and this bit and this bit and all of these guys, they've all been found in meteorites. Yep, and I'll come to that in a couple of slides. Thank you, excellent question. 
You can also synthesize them just starting from the, gas the gases that were in the early Earth atmosphere and doing lightning, like the Miller-Urey experiment, or heating and different kinds of chemistry. Starting from material on the Earth, you can also build up these simple monomers. All right. So bolides include comets, meteorites, whatever. They could have been sources of organic molecule delivery. Today, we can find these meteorites called carbonaceous chondrites, contain a lot of organic carbon in them. So exogenous from the outside, or origin outside the Earth. Endogenous, origin, genus within the Earth or on the Earth. And so there are many, so if it's, if it's in, um, endogenous synthesis, as I said, atmospheric gases, UV light, lightning, uh, volcanic gases, um, you could have uh, hydrothermal vents under the ocean, you could have geysers at the surface of the earth, impact craters on the surface of the earth, which is where some of Barbara's colleagues and mine in this Earth 4D CIFAR group, we are currently working on trying to figure out organic molecule synthesis on the earth, starting with in impact crater sites. Um, and you always have the mineral water interface the reactions have to involve both, in my opinion, the mineral and the water. Plug for myself, $9.99 on Apple TV. <laughs> this is an award-winning movie that came out in 2020, and we were supposed to go all over the place, including Canada, for the ceremonies, but COVID hit. So uh, those of you who are geeky and artsy will know Werner Herzog, yeah? And those who are not, well, those who are totally cool and hip will know <laughs> Professor Clive Oppenheimer. He's a volcanologist, amazing person. He's also made another movie on volcanoes with Dr. Herzog. So the cool thing about this movie is they look at the impact of meteorites, pun intended, on earth history, life history, and on social, cultural, mythological uh, connections of, cultural connections of meteorites. A lot of people would predict, uh, sort of, when they saw meteors and whatnot, uh, comets, think that that was a good or a bad omen. All right, so how do we solve this problem of which molecule came first? How to make these RNA monomer, uh, oligomers and um, the membrane-forming molecules? All right, so the question is, hypothesis is minerals did the catalysis, enzymes were not there to do the catalysis, so is this actually demonstrable? All right, so what we're first going to look at, I'm going to do three parts of this talk if I can have time, and if not, we'll quit. So um, this is a long mouthful. What are we looking at? We're looking at RNA polymerization. It's being catalyzed by a mineral called a clay mineral and co-catalyzed by amino acids. Remember I said in that prebiotic soup, that would have been everything, right? So we're trying to make, understand what happens when you make the system a little more complicated than just what we want. And the, and the catalyst, all right? So just to give you, uh, to remind you, this is the step that we're gonna focus on, and the clay mineral is what we're focusing on, plus amino acids are in this soup. All right, now 30 years ago, Dr. Uh, Ferris um, and his, uh, his workers, actually it was, yeah, and Dr. Atem um, and Dr. Joshi, these were the three major players at Ron Salaire showed that if you start with an RNA monomer, Here's one, here's another one. As I said, this oxygen from this carbon attacks the phosphate, and you get the dimer. And if you throw in, this is just in water with pH 7, and some amount of magnesium, 75 millimoles, some amount of sodium chloride, this is to mimic seawater. If you just have this water system, you just get a short dimer. But if you throw in this magic mineral, Montmorillonite clay, it's an aluminosilicate sodium bearing clay, then you get a longer chain of about seven or eight oligomers. Okay, now I'm showing this to you schematically. Each of these blobs is meant to indicate one monomer. But the mechanism was not known. What is it about this crystal mineral structure and not any other? Well, how is this happening? Not really known. And then Dr. Ferris got Alzheimer's. His lab kind of fell apart and nothing was done with this for about 10, 15 years. All right, so the question kind of lay there. Um, how do we get longer chains than a 7 mer? How do we improve the polymerization efficiency, in other words? And a second problem, which was discovered later, was that 
Here they use 75 millimolar magnesium, but those protocell membranes that are not made of phospholipids, they collapse if you put magnesium more than, say, 5 millimolar, 10 millimolar, very low concentration. Um, so you need to make uh, RNA with a lower concentration of magnesium uh, if you want to do it in, in a membrane that is not phospholipid, but is the proto-phospholipid molecule, proto-membrane forming molecule. So here's the, repeating the exact same thing now, here's the mineral, here's the monomer, here are those conditions, no amino acids, this is the chain length you get of oligomers. Now we said, by the way, there was also uh, amino acids around in your early environment, so let's start putting in some amino acids, and we saw some beautiful trends based on the detailed chemistry of the amino acids. So for those of you who are not biologists here, don't get um, worried. Let's just say that amino acids are a category of molecules, and they have, they have some features in common, which is why they're in a family, but then they're very small, they have some differences which are critical in how they behave chemically. So it turns out that certain amino acids that belong to this group of nonpolar amino acids promoted that reaction to get longer RNA oligomers compared to the no amino acid reference. Uh, another category of amino acids also had this promoting effect. And then this other category of amino acids called basic and, the, and polar had an inhibitory effect. Okay, so if in the early environment you had amino acids and RNA and this mineral around, these guys would do the promotion, these guys would inhibit, and we know this because we do our analyses using two techniques. One is called mild time of flight mass spectrometry. How do we know any of this? We do mass spectrometry. Here are the peaks um, corresponding to the molecular weight of uh, each of these oligomers. And we do another technique called high performance liquid chromatography. Each of these peaks corresponds to an oligomer. So by both techniques, we can confirm our products. So, yes. No, please, please, yeah, this, I, I love it, please, yeah. Uh, so I, I, I'm interested in uh, hearing about the handedness of amino acids. Mm -hmm. Because some of the arguments about what comes in is, well, you know, meteorites are just both handedness and what we end up with. Yeah. It's only one hand. Yeah. So that's a brilliant question, and that's being worked on in my lab as well as in other people's lab. In addition to the handedness, there's another detailed about question about amino acids. What I haven't told you about is that biology uses something called only alpha amino acids, but there are such things called beta, gamma, delta, which you find in meteorites, which the original spark discharge experiment by Miller and Urey also produced. So why did biology choose alpha amino acids out of this prebiotic soup? Why did it choose the left-handed amino acids and not the right-handed ones? On the contrary, life chose the right-handed RNA and not the left-handed RNA. So there's a complementarity to the amino acids and RNA. Those are things which I w we are currently working on and I have unpublished results. So I didn't include them here because we're recording it, but we can talk in private about that or after we turn off the recording. <laughs> It's not been peer reviewed, so that's the only thing. I don't want to, yeah, if it's not correct or, you know, agreed upon by experts as correct, I don't want to talk about it. But, but yes, it, good it, questions. It pretty ah, yes, so yeah. that's, so yes, so in the field, there are two lines of thought. Some people think the selection happened at what's called the monomer level, others mm -hmm. think it happened at the macromolecule level. Once you made a molecule, maybe it had left handed, maybe it had right handed, maybe it had mixtures, you know, one. Peptide may have been 80% one thing and 20% the other. Another peptide may have been 50-50. And, and maybe the 50-50 one was more easily broken down because it's not as strong versus the 80-20, which may have been less easily broken down. So selection happened at the macromolecule level according to some. The truth is somewhere probably in the middle as is the case with most of these things in Origins of Life, which real, nobody really knows as I said. <laughs> Okay, so, but I said these ones were inhibiting, but honestly not inhibiting, so if you, remember if you have no mineral at all, you only get the dimer. So even if you get a tetramer, it's, you know, not too bad. It's less than a seven, but not too bad. And I'll tell you why in a second. 
But the more cool thing is that the ones that are promoting glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, glutamate, and aspartate, these are the ones that are the dominant ones found in meteorites. These guys are not found at all in meteorites, so they were not, most likely not present on early Earth. Come on up and have a seat. Yeah. Don't be shy. There are seats up here, too. Um, serine is found in meteorites. Um, but this is the only one which is found in meteorites and which we find is inhibiting, all right? All right, so the prebiotically most abundant uh, ones are the ones that are promoting the reaction, so that's cool. The longer RNA you get, the more chances of it folding and becoming a functional RNA. Now we have to deal with the issue of that 75 millimolar magnesium, which destroys protocell membranes. So if you have the mineral, you have the RNA monomer, if you put 75 millimolar, you get the dimer. Magnesium. If you don't put any magnesium, you still get the dimer. Okay. Now, if you add a promoting amino acid like glutamic acid without any magnesium, you get a tetramer. And I, I, I'm going to just do this in one jump now. 5, 10, 15, all the way up to 75, 100 millimolar, you get longer and longer chains. Okay. What this is telling us is the mineral is a catalyst. The promoting amino acids are catalysts, and magnesium is a catalyst. So they're all co-catalysts in getting longer um, RNA chains. So this is good because you can start getting decent length uh, oligomers by about 15 millimolar when you have a promoting amino acid around and this catalyst mineral around. Now, what is a sufficiently long RNA? You know, our RNAs are are huge. This is a joke, you know, you show this to a biologist, they'll be rolling over. <laughs> <laughs> um, people in the origins of life field have looked for what is the shortest RNA uh, oligomer that can act as an enzyme or be active as an RNA. So what they found is that the shortest RNA enzyme is five oligomers. And uh, you can have an, only a dimer or a trimer, dimer or a trimer, three of these, that's long enough to have an RNA template and an RNA primer. So any of you who are biologists, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not biologists, never mind. All it means is that you only need between two and five-ish length in order to get something useful for getting biological activity, all right? And so by that token, we're like, you know, 200% longer. Sounds better in percentage, right? <laughs> Than saying it's five times longer or something. All right. So that's the story about RNA. Uh, we have more stuff coming out in the next year, hopefully, about questions like the chirality and the alpha, beta, gamma amino acid selection. So that issue is called selection from your prebiotic soup. How do you pick out only a few things and not the others? All right. Now I want to talk about um, the protocell membrane. So remember we said the phospholipid molecules are too difficult to make prebiotically. So something else had to be formed. In order to get this kind of self-assembly, this is very kind of similar to your soap molecules. They're basically called amphi files, because amphi being both, and file as in loving, because it loves both water and uh, oil, okay, or fatty, um, not polar and non-polar solvents. So prebiotically in meteorites, what have been found are these things that are single chain amphi files. What you'll notice about the phospholipid is that it has, it has two of these so-called fatty tails because these are the insoluble parts that dissolve in oil, hence they're called fatty tails. Whereas these single chain amphiphiles have just the one. And then this is the hydrophilic head group. This is a COH alcohol head group, COOH acid head group. So these are called fatty alcohols and fatty acids. And Dr. David Diemer in the Late 90s, early 2000s, extracted these from meteorites, stuck them in water, and they formed beautiful membranes under the microscope on the order of 300 nanometer up to about 10 micron in size. A bacterial cell is about a micron-ish in size. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with these kind of things. Uh, these are the kind of molecules that self-assemble into vesicles but are very susceptible to that magnesium. All right. And they only are f forming a membrane at around pH 7 to 8, not under anything lower, not under anything higher. 
the chemistry of that, if you want to talk about it, I can get into in discussion. So we want to make a molecule that's going to be stable to magnesium, that's going to be stable over a wide pH range, because you have different environments on the early Earth. So how do we do this? All right. We have to start with organic molecules which we know are already present in the environment. So what shall we start with? We're going to start with that alcohol which I just showed you, the fatty alcohol. And these are two different kinds of amino acids. We know they are present in the environment. Mix them together, pH around 4 or 5, 50 degrees Celsius, very mild heating. Uh, and, and keep, so when, when the acid part combines with the alcohol part, you get the elimination of a water molecule. And when you dry it up to 50 degrees Celsius, you evaporate all that molecule of water that's being formed. Uh, then you get a product like this. So here's that fatty tail and the O from the OH. And then um, the H from here and the OH from here have been eliminated as H2O. And now you get this O directly uh, bonding over here to the carbon. So you get the O carbon and then this double bond and the amine. All right, so here's the amine head group from the amino acid. And then you get this fatty tail from the fatty alcohol. Now this forms, depending on which amino acid you start with, we tried two different ones. One is glycine, one is called isoleucine, doesn't really matter. It's an amino acid, ester, amphiphile, kind of a chimeric molecule. It has a water-loving part because this part will be charged uh, NH3+, plus, uh, plus this is polar, so it has a hydrophilic part and it has a hydrophobic part. And um, in the environment, as we said, so here's, here's this molecule, the, the glycine molecule made with this. Here's the isoleucine molecule made with the isoleucine. Uh, it has an additional, you know, couple of methyls here. And remember, we keep talking about there being different molecules present in the environment. There's this one, there's that one. So we said, okay, let's also throw in the original alcohol molecule along with these guys, add a little more, add some ac uh, fatty acid. What are we going to get? Turns out, we get vesicles in a mixture of this product molecule plus octanoic acid, which is this acid head group, or octanoic alcohol, which is one of the starting compounds, just added in excess. You can at get stable vesicles at pH 2 up to all the way to pH 10. And you can throw in 0.1 molar, that's 100 millimolar magnesium, and the vesicles don't get disrupted. If you had made vesicles only of the octanoic acid and alcohol, your stability range for pH was around 7 to 8, and magnesium around 5 millimolar, okay, as opposed to 100 millimolar. So this is a really beautiful molecule uh, mixture. It's, again, a complex mixture. Amino acid, fatty alcohol, fatty acid, um, gentle treatment, and you get lovely stable vesicles, protocell membranes, okay? So this is really... Uh, Revolution, and I love these fluorescence images. The, the, the dye goes into that fatty membrane part, and it, it fluoresces under the microscope. And these are pretty big ones, right? But there's millions, billions of tiny 200, 400 nanometer ones that you can't resolve under the microscope. If you take it to the cryotransmission electron microscope, you can see them everywhere. Sorry, just real quick. Is that, is that actual movement of the phospholipids? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the best, the, these are not phospholipids, but yeah, these amphiphiles, right? Yeah. And so this just summarizes the pH range over which they're stable for particular mixtures, right? So we tried this GOE product molecule with octanoic acid in a 3 is to 1 mixture, uh, with octanoic alcohol in a 1 is to 1 mixture, octanol alcohol in a 3 is to 1 mixture. Didn't matter. Decanol doesn't have to be oct We used octanol and decanol. That's eight carbons versus 10 carbons, because those are the ones found in the meter, right? So we know they were there. Uh, the longer this thing gets, the more tight the membrane gets, and the more selective it is, which is even better. All right. Now, so this is stuff we just published, but about five, seven years ago, I was still under the impression of working with these, these guys, membranes formed of these, which is what everybody uses in the literature. And so some years back, we had done a project where we wanted to see can we make these membranes off those fatty acid, fatty alcohol? And you can make them in water straight up, but if you put minerals in the system, because they're there in the environment, does that help or hinder? Do they rupture the membranes? Do they help the membranes form? 
we can measure the rate of membrane formation here um, as a function of charge on the mineral surface. Okay? All minerals have a charge on them when you put them in water. I can talk about the chemistry of it later, but they're either positively charged or negatively charged. So um, here's a cryo transmission electron microscope image with a 100 nanometer scale bar. These are little nanoparticles of titania, TiO2, anatase. And these are vesicles made out of these fatty acids and fatty alcohols, and you can see there's no rupturing. It doesn't have to, you don't have to worry about the shape of it. You can take needle-like uh, minerals like this mineral called goethite. Uh, it doesn't rupture the, mem the membranes. You don't see any ruptured membranes out of the microscope. Also by analytical techniques, we don't see that happening. So we used a wide variety of minerals. Monolinite, the one that was catalyzing the RNA. Quartz, this is the one that you, know, you get all that good energy or something from. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's energy from all these things, supposedly. I'm joking. Comatiite and tonalite, yeah, my caveat, right? You gotta get that out there. Comatiite and tonalite crushed up. These are actual early earth rocks representing early uh, oceanic crust and early continental crust. So they're not just simple minerals, they actually hold rocks. Uh, another kind of titania, uh, here's one kind of titania shown here. The anatase or beta TiO2, here's one called alpha TiO2. Um, an iron sulfide mineral called pyrite, plenty of this in early earth. Zinc oxide, not much of this around in early Earth, but we include it because it represents a range of these surface charges, okay? So this is a measure, this is a, basically think of this as a pH scale. Okay, this is a pH scale. The pH of the experiment is seven. The minerals which have isoelectric points less than seven have a negative charge net on their surface, and those that have an isoelectric point greater than seven have a positive surface charge. And these things, fatty acids, are negatively charged, so it makes sense. Negatively charged absorbs more quickly and favorably to a positively charged mineral, forming little islands, which are then going to promote further absorption and vesicle formation. And so these rates of vesicle formation are higher for the positively charged than the negatively charged minerals. You can also see there's a separation by size, micron size versus nanometer size. Okay, and so here is the rate of assembly normalized to surface area of the particles per meter square. Now you might think nanometer particle has higher specific surface area than a large chunky micron sized one. So this should have a greater catalytic effect than this one, right? And that is true, it should. But when you look under, so we will confuse it first. But when you look under the microscope, what you see is these nanometer sized minerals, they're like, what is this, about 10, 20, 30 nanometer in size each one? The whole surface area is not available to the membrane. They're clumped together, right? And they're forming these aggregates that are pretty darn big. And so only the outer surface area is available for these membrane-forming molecules to actually form their membranes. So that's why it would appear that, um, that the rate of formation is depressed. So every mineral we tested, whether it was an oxide, whether it was a carbonate, whether it was an oxyhydroxide, a sulfide, a com conglomerate of different uh, aluminosilicate minerals, a pure aluminosilicate mineral, micron size, nanometer sized, uh, particular amorphous solids versus crystalline solids, one particular crystal form of a, mil of a chemical composition versus a different crystal form of that same chemical composition, all of them promoted membrane formation. And this, they de this rate for depends on structural and chemical properties of these minerals. The isoelectric point is the emergent property of that structure and chemistry of the mineral. You can predict the isoelectric point of a mineral. If you tell me I have on Mars XYZ minerals, okay, for my PhD what I did was give me the structure and chemistry of a mineral, I can predict the isoelectric point for you. And therefore, I can tell you at a given pH whether it's going to have a positive or a negative charge. So if you tell me on Mars there's X mineralogy, I can tell you uh, if it was under acidic conditions, then this would be the charge on these minerals, and this is the rate at which that particular mineral would have helped a potential protocell if it were ever there to self-assemble. What time do we have? We have, it's at 2 now. We have got all, we have all from 2 to 2.30. Okay. So you Give me five more minutes, yeah, huh? Exactly. If you're not too tired. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah. All right. So it's kind of up to you. I'll, I'll wrap this up then. I think I was going to do this only if there's time. So far, I talked about the RNA t 
to monomer to oligomer by mineral catalysis, formation of the uh, membranes of fatty acid by mineral catalysis, as well as formation of unique new membrane forming molecules. Um, metabolism is really complicated, okay, and so uh, no one can do all of it at once. So all we can hope to do is to bite off little bits of it. So the little bit of it that I've tried to bite off is how do you make a membrane and harvest energy from the environment, which is what cells do. When they, when they extract energy from the environment, whether that's sunlight if you're photosynthesizing bacteria, or whether it's a, a chemical gradient like uh, sulfate reducing bacteria would use, right? At the end of the day, when you say you're harnessing energy, what does it mean? It means they're taking that energy from the environment and storing it in a chemical molecule. That molecule is called ATP, and another way they store it is in this, they carry it around, is called this molecule NADH. But there's a whole phospholipid membrane, and there's very complicated enzymes and membrane-spanning molecules, channels, and ATP synthase, which is a very complicated machine to make all of these things. Okay, so we have to do this, try and do bits of it anyway in a very simple way. So we're going to try and see how to do this. All right. So we make a, a protocell membrane. We've done this with a classic phospholipid, which is normal cell today, plus fatty acid, fatty alcohol, which is protocell. What we do is we add on the outside of the, of the cell in its environment some of these minerals like iron sulfide, the pyrite. Uh, remember, let me show you. This guy, pyrite, it was a very common mineral because there's no oxygen in the environment. Uh, you, you could, all the iron coming out of the rock would combine with the sulfide in the atmosphere and make iron sulfide in the water. Cadmium sulfide, also commonly present in early earth, titania. Zinc oxide was not, but this is sort of our control, ex control mineral. These are all photocatalytic minerals. When you shine a particular wavelength of light, characteristic to that mineral, you generate a hole and an electron. Okay, I don't know how many of you have had uh, material science or, or mineralogy a little bit, but basically this is what your semiconductors also do. You shine a little light, you, you, okay. you generate what's called a hole and an electron. All right, the hole, which is like an imaginary positive entity, sort of the anti to the electron, gets transferred to uh, an organic molecule, basically a reduced organic compound, which is out in the environment. We know there's glycine, there's amino acids, there's sugar, all kinds of things out in the prebiotic environment. So it's reduced carbon, and it gets oxidized by this hole to some oxidized molecule of carbon, whatever it is, I don't care. But in that process, it also generates a proton, right? So if you write a half reaction of an organic that's reduced to an organic that's oxidized, you have to produce protons on the other side. Um, the electron um, cannot cross the membrane on its own because the electron is charged. The fatty part of the, the tails don't like charged things in there. So you need to have a transporter. That is a polyaromatic hydrocarbon. This is in our modern cells. This is called the electron transport chain. And the electron transfer is done by a molecule called a quinone. And the quinone has a structure very similar to the polyaromatic hydrocarbon. These are found in meteorites. We know they're made out in space somehow. So we have embedded them in the membrane. And so the polyaromatic hydrocarbon picks up an electron, goes into the excited state shown by the asterisk here, and then transfers the electron over to another molecule, which is encapsulated inside this protocell. This other molecule is called an electron mediator because it takes the electrons from here, outside, through the PAH, and, this, uh, and transfers it onto something else. So it mediates the transfer to something else. And this molecule is made up of an organo, tris bipyridinium, metallo complex, rhodium, rhodium, ruthenium, platinum. These are all highly catalytic uh, metals. So this organometallic complex is then capable of transferring. Uh, you see there's a three plus charge on it. Because it got reduced by these electrons, it became a plus one. It's got picked up two electrons. And now this reduced form is able to give up 
two of its electrons that it had just picked up, it transfers those two, therefore it's called a mediator, to this other molecule inside here called NAD plus, and reduces that to NADH. Okay, and in the process, this plus one gets regenerated back to a three plus. So this is very similar in a sense to what happens inside a cell in terms of uh, generation of NADH from NAD by electron transport, like photosynthesis, um, photosynthesis, the chlorophyll picks up the energy, transfers it through a quinone uh, into an electron transport chain. In the process, protons are pumped out. You get an acidification outside relative to the inside. So now what you've done, you've built up a proton gradient, higher concentration, lower concentration. That proton gradient is used by biology. There's a complicated protein in here in the membrane in modern biology called ATP synthase which then uses the energy of the gradient to make ATP inside the cell. But that is a hugely complicated machine. I was joking yesterday in our meeting that it's like if you were to find, it's like uh, you know, a uh, Maserati, basically, of the, uh, of the enzyme world. So you can't have that you know, prebiotically. So we have not yet used, put this energy to any good use. We haven't harvested that bit of the energy. We have harvested the electron bit in doing the NAD plus to NADH, all of this without any enzymes. How do we know any of this is happening? How do we know protons are being generated outside? We can measure the pH uh, as you irradiate over a period of one hour, two hours, three hours. Uh, you can measure uh, the, the, the change in the pH using a fluorescent dye. Um, it changes color as the pH of the system changes. Doesn't matter. Um, we can establish it using this, this dye. I can talk more about the details uh, later if you like, just to save you time. How, how do we know NADH is being formed? Um, NADH um, absorbs light and then emits it at 450 nanometers, so it's a fluorescence. We can track the intensity of the fluorescence, which will tell you how much NADH is being made as you irradiate over one, two, three hours. So let's take uh, green alkyte when you irradiate with this green alkyte mineral on the outside, zero hours, hardly any NADH, one hour, two hours, and three hours. So you get a buildup, and the amount built up depends on how good a catalyst the mineral is. So this is one of the best catalysts, but it wasn't around as much. It was around, but not as much. This guy is not as efficient, but it was around everywhere. So it could have had an equivalent effect. All right, so you can generate a transmembrane proton gradient as well as do NAD to NADH reduction simply by using a photocatalytic mineral. No enzymes. Um, we have yet to harvest the energy of these protons to do anything useful in here. All right. So is the hypothesis experimentally demonstrable? That was a question I started with. Yeah, this is why I'm here. Is it what happened? No clue. Right? No way to know. So um, some ways that we may have some clues to whether it is less plausible or more, we will never know for sure, but to know whether it's more or less plausible, we can try to study the surface of some other planets that have not been recycled by plate tectonics, such as Mars, where if there was ever plate tectonics, it pretty much shut down early if it even ever started. And so the surface of Mars is Older, most of the surface of Mars is older than three and a half billion years old. And that's that period, remember, in Earth history that we don't have the rock record. Um, so we could go look for stuff there. So this is a beautiful image, by the way, which my colleague, he's a clay mineralogist at BYU, made using uh, DALI, the AI software. Appropriately, sort of indeterminate, uh, dark-haired woman. So to wrap up, prebiotic world had a messy soup of different things. Uh, there was probably coevolution of these molecules rather than one molecule first and the other molecule later. I would suggest that minerals had to have been involved because they were there and they're capable of doing cat cat catalytic reactions. You have to be careful about the environments in which you're doing these. You can't just randomly cook up any environment you want, which makes the chemistry happen. And at some point, you had to have selection, chiral selection, alpha over beta selection, all of those different. Why only 20 amino acids? There's ton, hundreds of amino acids found in meteorites. How did 20 of them get used? Why only four nucleobases for RNA and DNA? 
There's many other possible nuclear bases which have been found. So we claim that there's mineral catalysis, but you know, we can't really know. All right, my lovely students who do all the work, former student Putu Sriyana, former postdoc Poonam, former student Emma, former student Jiadong, current students Rui Bo Reagan, uh, and two former postdocs were here until earlier this year. If you want to have a general science, very like undergrad level uh, introduction to this topic, you can look at this beautiful series of magazine, this magazine called Elements that's published by various mineralogical and geochemical societies internationally. All right, and funding, very, very grateful, especially CIFAR and um, huge funds from Dr. Weil. All right, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Nita. I'm, is this, this is on, Del? Yeah, okay. Just because we're recording, uh, we have to use the mic for the questions and the answers. So please uh, join me, as you've just done, in thanking Nita for her th very thought provoking and beautiful, I mean, really beautiful slides. Thank it's you. We're really that. already into the artistic side <laughs> of the program for today. But what I'd like to do is just pass the microphone around to anyone who would like to. Uh, ask a question, make a comment, uh, tell us a little bit more about interplanetary dust, Peter. <laughs> Thanks for coming. It's so good to see you. This is really appropriate because the theme for today's forum, it always comes out of conversations with the junior fellows. And so I really have to give our thanks to someone most of you know, Sishu Iyagar, who was not only an alumni of Massey, but Don of Hall, and that uh, was his suggestions and conversations that led to today's topic. So it's very appropriate for you to lead off the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you, Barbara. You. But I have to say, I came mostly just to get my ego fluffed up. <laughs> so I, I got what I needed. Neither, thank you for the talk. Uh -huh. uh, one question I have, and we actually had a chance already to talk about it a little bit. From the way you described the, the work you did, it seems like the, the paradigm that it uh, c comes into this, chemically speaking, is we have normal chemical reactions. Yeah, some of them might be unfavorable, but we just have normal chemical reactions, and if, if you just throw in the right ingredients plus a little bit of energy, you get lucky, and then maybe it can start spiraling out of control. So my question is, do you think that that will ultimately be kind of on the chemistry side of things, the picture of what is the origin of life? Uh, or do you think that there's something more uh, to it? Like there's going to be a further principle of chemistry, maybe a deeper principle about catalysis that right now, because we just don't know enough mm -hmm. yet, we haven't seen. Yeah. No, that's an excellent question. And so the question is, you know, if you, if you th keep for another 100, 500 years throwing a bunch of minerals and organic molecules together, are you going to make a cell effectively, right? Um, or if you take a cell today and, and spin it in a centrifuge and break the membrane and get all the bits in a little test tube and then you throw them all together again, is it going to form a cell, a living cell again? No. So we ca I do not think personally, this is not what everybody in my field necessarily thinks, I do not personally think necessarily we can bridge the gap, we can only get clues and, and sort of principles of what might have happened from this sort of bottom up reductionist approach. So there's a growing movement now in this field to come at it from the diverse, com kind of the com complexity and um, top-down approach. I find that a very fascinating um, area, but again, that what, so in that field what people tend to do is, I have one or three or five things in my, in my witch's brew, they'll have like 50 different things, right? And then just let the reaction go, do whatever, you know, wet dry cycle, 100 cycles, and then you get this mass spectrum peak that you know, looks like the jungles of the Amazon with you know, peaks you have no idea what they are, but they have different increasingly smart ways of, you know, once with, one, not yet done this, but once it'll happen soon enough with AI in the picture, you'll be able to you know, analyze your peaks, figure it all out, and then you can get principles like, as I, if I do five wet and dry cycles, this is the number of peaks I get. As I do 100 cycles, actually the number of peaks seems to shrink. So somehow maybe there's a complexification stage and then the simplification, the selection stage that comes in, right? So those are the sorts of principles 
you might be able to harvest, rather than these are the precise molecules and this is the precise pathway, which is the sort of thing, I didn't show you any mechanisms, but I cannot publish any of this without a mechanism, right? So those are the slides which are in the backup for those who are chemically minded. We can talk about those ad nauseum and I can get into all the nitty gritty. But that's kind of, you know, more sort of the reductionist approach, which is what we all do. But yeah, the answer is, I don't think you can build a cell bottom up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the lectures. Uh, it was amazing. Um, I, you mentioned meteorites. Continuing with some other questions already yeah. from the audience about meteorites, um, <coughs> can you explain maybe um, what's special about them? Other than you know the, the question sometimes would be, oh, panspermia they played a part, but is that just punt the question down the road? Yeah. Kind of an Aristotle first mover, mover just like suddenly, oh, another planet right. or somewhere else. Right. But it seems what I'm learning from your lecture is that there's actual special ingredients in the meteorites that are different than that happen on a terrestrial or a planetary scale. So can you maybe define how sure. they're special? Yes. So excellent question. Um, there are actually magic meteorites. That is to say there are meteorites and there are meteorites, right? Like for everything, there's the category of things coming out of the sky that are leftover bits of planet that didn't form a planet. Um, that's called a meteorite. Among them, there are some that are iron-nickel meteorites that are made up of pretty much only iron and nickel alloy, some that are called stony meteorites that look like any rock. You wouldn't know how to distinguish it from any other rock on the Earth. Among the stony meteorites, there are what are called chondrites and achondrites. Chondrites are those that have certain structural features and how the minerals are, have grown. They contain these little concentric kind of circular things called chondrules and therefore chondritic meteorites. And then the achondrites are, are stony meteorites that don't have those structures. It tells you something about the conditions under which they formed. Among the chondritic meteorites, you have subcategories, the carbonaceous chondrites and the non-carbonaceous chondrites. The carbonaceous chondrites are the one that contain these thousands of organic molecules, some very simple, some so complex that they don't dissolve in water, you have to extract them with organic solvents. You know, molecular weights of tens of thousands. Um, so those particular meteorites have presumably the right mineralogy and were formed in the right conditions where in space you could have um, organic chemistry happen, presumably catalyzed not only by mineral surfaces but gamma radiation, UV radiation, who knows what else. So there is a whole community of people that are actually trying to do organic molecule synthesis on uh, meteorite surfaces. To what extent, you know, today those are carbonaceous chondrites that are a small fraction of all the meteorites falling to the earth. Um, I'm not a meteoriticist, but depending on, uh, I think they may or may not, the current ratio may or may not be the same as it was in the past, I don't remember now. But the rate of delivery was much more frequent than it is now, just because the whole solar system is just forming, you know, lots of things flying around. You look at the surface of the moon, how cratered it is. Uh, that's, you know, you know how many impacts were happening. Um, so, did I answer your question? Yes, yeah, so just to, to <laughs> clarify that meteorites allow a different environment yeah. for different chemistry Out to in develop. Space yeah. That then is an, an interesting kind of exogenic. Yes. Element source of delivery source of, of simple molecules, which right. you still have to polymerize and get to be functional and make a cell. And so do you believe that it's the combination of these two things together, which is the most Endo likely and exogenous, yeah. yes, yes, must have been. Right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Now, the question is, you know, how do you survive the impact? Why aren't these organics just volatilizing, right? The pressures and temperatures are tremendous. So they've actually done where they found, they've been lucky enough in certain areas to go actually harvest the, uh, the meteorite uh, as soon as it fell within a few hours, as well as they've done simulations in the lab. Turns out that the, as it's going through atmospheric entry, and uh, there's a lot of ablation of the outer surface, as well as if it impacts, you know, that the nose of it uh, gets a lot of shock and vaporization, but the inside still remains cold and frozen. And of course, this will depend on how big the particle or meteorite is. But yeah, so you can still preserve stuff on the inside. Could you have had one, you know, a whole cell riding along? Why not, maybe? But as you said, it just pushes the problem to another planet. Yeah. 
have a question. Thank you. Um, you mentioned near the start that tides might have been quite important to get the right kind of conditions um, with the, the tide coming in and then drying out, concentrating mm. the organic so that to catalyze the reactions. Um, but in the outer solar system, for example, most of the water is trapped beneath icy surfaces, mm -hmm. um, on like Enceladus and Europa, yeah. for instance. Yeah. I was wondering if that might be an example of like a rate limiting step that could prevent an origin of life on right. those kind of environments, or if there was anything else that's chemically different about them right. compared to terrestrial planets like Earth. Right, okay, great question. So what he's talking about is that in the old days, there used to be this idea that you have to be able to have liquid water to be a planet that is in the habitable zone or to be habitable, the zone of the solar system where the temperature is just right, that it's not all evaporated, or it's where it's too hot, like Venus or Mercury, or it's too cold out, like Mars and beyond, where it's so cold that anything will freeze immediately. So Earth was sort of in a sweet, habitable zone spot. But then they found these other uh, satellites around large planets like Europa, which I think is, a, yeah, it's a Jovian, uh, Jupiter uh, satellite. Saturn has some, Enceladus. Where, there, yes, there's a frozen thick layer of ice on the surface, but inside, because of tidal warming, that is to say, interactions between other planets around and the uh, other satellites, and these massive Jupiter and Saturn-like plan uh, planets, the whole planet bulges tidally, okay? And not just the water, but the whole planet, which ours does too, but there it's extreme. And so that provides enough frictional heating that under the icy layer, there's liquid water, ocean. And so people are very excited about this because it extends the potential habitable worlds, you know, tremendously. So the question is, do you need these wet, dry cycles to get organic chemistry and life going? That is a convenient way of doing it. It is not the only way of doing it. There are people who on Earth want to have life start on hydrothermal vents, right? And there have been reactions, but there you need very high pressure, very high temperature, which is not, so yeah, maybe, which is why I, honestly, I don't get, so this is another big, you know, did RNA come first, did protein come first, did membrane come first? Is it life at the surface of the Earth? Is it life at the hydrothermal vent? I personally think these are unknowables, and if you can do the chemistry there and it works, good, it adds to the pot, right? more the merrier. At some point, all these different forms of proto-life had to go through some sort of a selection process where, you know, you might, if, if all this was happening everywhere, why don't we have all different kinds of life using 20 other amino acids or right-handed amino acids rather than left-handed? Presumably all of this was maybe around, but there was some sort of funneling evolutionarily where Modern life, it, all those other forms were less successful if they existed. And the, and the current form of all forms of life have evidently originated from some last universal common ancestor. So, you know, let's say you have 20 different types of proto-life going through this channel and then again diversifying. So that hypothetical last universal common ancestor is already a full-fledged modern <coughs> organism. It has a fully functional membrane, ATP synthase, RNA, DNA, everything that a modern cell has. So it's a long way from what we're talking about chemically, complexity-wise, not in time, to, to the last universal common ancestor. Thank you. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody. We have another half hour of coffee in which we can continue the conversations and questions a little bit more informally. Please do join us afterwards at 3 o'clock. We're starting a panel, as, which is going to be that looking at it from the other side, integrating the artistic component to uh, thinking about the origin of life inspired uh, by both scientists and uh, working people in the arts. And I, the other thing I just wanted to say is if you enjoyed today, please do remember to continue to get involved with Science at Massey. Although we call it Science at Massey because you can't add everything, it's in true Ursula Franklin fashion. It's not about science for scientists and engineers. It's an outward facing thing for the entire community. And depending on the year, we've done topics ranging from the ethics of space exploration, to the green energy transition, to science and policy around the uses of nuclear energy, to all kinds of fascinating topics. And where do those topics come from? They come from the students. They 
come from the junior fellows. So if you are interested in seeing a talk or a forum around a particular topic, please get in touch with us. Start to get involved, get engaged, and uh, next year we could be doing the topic that of your choosing. At least that's what we always hope. It's very much a grassroots, bottoms up program where we try to ensure that whatever we're doing actually reflects the interests of the junior fellows at Massey. And with that then, I want to once again thank Nita for her <laughs> wonderful talk. <laughs> and uh, I believe the coffee and cookies and things are lurking behind my shoulder. No, they're not. Uh, whereabouts? <laughs>